On company updates, please be honest. They're for you and not for us. And if you make them clearly crazy, like, you know, we're never ever launching, <laughs> we're launching in four million years, we'll get the hint. So don't do that. Um, there have been a lot of questions about the graduation requirement, which was that you had to submit nine out of 10 weekly updates. It, this course was originally a 10-week course, and things changed around a little bit. And it's actually more of a nine-week course now. And, so, and it was a little bit difficult for some groups to get going because of our little snafu in the beginning of the course. So, so here's the deal. Eight out of nine updates is just fine. But we're also going to extend the class, oh, actually really two weeks beyond the last lecture, so that there will be plenty of time to do 10 updates if you so choose, and you choose to do nine out of 10. But eight out of nine will be the absolute requirement for consideration for the, for the, the $10,000 grant. Um, so we're, we'll be flexible, but make them good updates. Make them real updates. Another reminder, those weekly updates are due 11.59 p.m. every Sunday, Pacific Standard Time. There's been some confusion, confusion about that. We've written it a number of times, but please recall when that is. Um, uh, uh, questions again about anything, about, about your moderators, about your groups, about your updates, please send to startupschool at ycombinator.com. And my very last note is a reminder to launch if you haven't already. The only way to find out if you've made something that people really want is to have people really use it. So get your products out there if you haven't. Um, now I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is uh, my esteemed partner at Y Combinator, Gustav Alstromer, who in 2012 was part of the group that built the growth team at Airbnb. And if you know anything about Airbnb, you know from 2012 for the next five years, they grew an enormous amount. This is something that Gustav knows better, or at least as good as anyone in the entire world. So I'm thrilled to have him talk today about growth. Thank you very much. Um, before I begin, thank you so much to Steven, Jeff, Adora, Bill for putting all this together so we can be here and do this today. Um, I'm going to talk about growth. My background before joining YC last summer was uh, being one of the first person on the growth team at Airbnb and then growing that team from, uh, I think we were three people in the beginning. Uh, this is how many people were in 2015. We then grew to 100, 120 people or something like that. Um, almost everything I'm talk talking about today here, I owe this group. That's sort of what I learned all this stuff. Uh, some of the best ways to learn to work on user growth is to actually work on a growth team. And I was fortunate to do that for, for almost five years at Airbnb. So before I start, one of the questions that might be obvious, the answer might be obvious for some people, but not for everyone, is sort of like, why should we do this? Why is growth important? And I, I, I'm surprised how often I actually uh, get this question, but it might be worth thinking about it for a second. So when you make a product, um, some people think that if you just put that product into the market, people will come and people will start using that product. In my experience, that's not really how the work world works. If you start a startup or a company that's aimed to be a startup, um, growth is important because that's actually what a startup is. If you make something that has the potential to be really big, then making that really big is sort of what startups are all about. There's actually a post that Paul Graham wrote that is called Startup Equals Growth, where he talks about specifically why growth is so important for startups. 
um, and why it's not important, why not every company is a startup, and why growth isn't important for every company, but for startups, it's, um, it's really, really important. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk in a second sort of like um, what it means to be intentional by growth. But, but the first question you kind of have to answer yes to is sort of like, I have a startup, I want to grow. Uh, now, how do we go, go about doing that? So who's this talk for? Um, in my experience, the kind of things you work on when you work on user growth started with consumer companies. That's, those were the kind of companies that um, started embracing a lot of the tactics and strategies and technologies that growth teams were doing. Now, I would argue that almost every company that sells anything online or get users online um, should be or could be um, using a lot of the skills and, and knowledge that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so you don't need to be just a consumer company. You don't need to be just a social network to apply these things. These are applicable to um, a wide range of, of companies. If you are a B2B company and are excellent at growth, you have a massive advantage to other companies in your space because they are probably not going to spend as much time doing growth as you are. Now, there is one type of companies who this is relevant for, but too early. And that actually might apply to most of you right now. And this is why this talk is dangerous. Because working on growth at the wrong time in your company's history can be like really, really bad for you. It's sort of like um, when you are kind of off to the races a little bit too ahead of time. So the most important thing, which is what a lot of the lectures here uh, Startup School is about, is how you make something people want and how you actually find product market fit. If you apply a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about here to a company that hasn't built something people want or haven't actually um, found product market fit, really bad things happen. You will very often, and this is a very common graph, grow like crazy in the beginning, but then when you realize that sort of like that fuel that you had isn't fueling anything, it's just fueled kind of evaporates, you come straight down. So that's why it's dangerous, and I'll, I can go into more details about that in a second, uh, of applying some of these things um, before you actually have product market fit. So the first thing I'm talking about today is going to be around measurement, around product market fit, because that's actually the most essential part for, for continuing growth. Now, um, do growth teams have impact, or are growth teams sort of like, uh, um, uh, like how do you know the growth teams actually matter? Uh, how do you know that, that these things matter? I'm going to talk about that as well. I'm going to talk about experimentation. Um, but before I get there, I want to get, tell you a story from Facebook. And this is not a story I came up with myself. I, I found it on one of the talks from Facebook. And I think it's so essential for um, describing the level of impact you can have if you are um, uh, applying these kind of skill sets uh, to a company. So this is the timeline of Facebook from 2004 to 2015. Um, it's sort of their growth story. Um, some of this is public, some of, some of this wasn't. Um, the one thing Facebook had, they had an excellent data science team from the early days. Um, they were really good at measuring, sort of like forecasting how big Facebook was going to be. So back in 2006, 2007, when Facebook had just started the growth team, they had um, a bunch of data scientists doing this, this sort of forecasting. How big will Facebook eventually be? And they looked at all the type of metrics that F Facebook had, and, and they came to the conclusion that Facebook will be roughly 400 million users by 2015. That was their forecast by using all the data that they had. Now, we know that wasn't really true. They actually started growing really fast in 2008, 2009. Um, and this actually, uh, as a result of something that the growth team came up with. Anyone here who had an idea of what would make Facebook grow so fast in 2000, 2008, roughly 2007, 2008? Uh, didn't they open it to high school students? Opening. Opening to high school students. Yes, they did, but that wasn't as big of a growth. Newsfeed was 2005. Sorry? Recession. Recession did not. No. <laughs> 10 friends on... Yeah, that's good. That actually, that's sort of like the growth story all across. Image tagging could have been that. Translations is the answer. So this is 
surprising for many for many of you might maybe, but this is actually core part of many growth teams is that you want to make your product available for as many people in the world. And Facebook started sort of hitting the limit on people that spoke English. And they assumed that people, just because Facebook was in English, and sorry, the, the content were in a local language and Facebook were in English, it would continue to scale. That wasn't the case. So they implemented this new platform that automatically translated Facebook into hundreds of languages and, and the growth re-accelerated. Now, the same thing started to happen again. Um, I think they call this lockdown, but they were doing very important things. In 2010, 2011, something very big was happening, and Facebook had to make some really large changes, uh, to some extent also driven by sort of like using data to figure out these things. Any the idea what what um, what happened in 2010? It was a really big acceleration. Mobile. I heard mobile. So, so actually what's happening is that the data scientists at Facebook were forecasting Facebook to be about... 700 million users or something like that. And um, because um, most of those people are using Facebook on computers, they hadn't intended this massive shift that was happening in 2010, 2011, which is people getting on smartphones. And Facebook switching the entire team, they had even have large training classes for engineers to start learning mobile. So, so this was the, the big change that happened then. And then actually one more thing happened, sort of like in 2013, 2014, where they made a forecast, they were kind of kind of not hitting the, the ceiling of growth again, but then something again happened. Any idea what happened sort of 2013, 2014? Instagram. Instagram, Instagram, Instagram and WhatsApp could be good answers. That's not what I'm looking for here. Messenger, Messenger is a good answer. It's not what I'm looking for. So Facebook actually running into um, the ceiling of the internet, the number of people actually that were online. So they started this thing called internet.org, which was intended to get more people online. And they went to carriers and they gave, basically worked with carriers to get people online to get free Facebook. And this actually were very important for sort of uh, the continuous growth of Facebook. Now, what can we learn from this? Well, we can learn that the initial forecast of Facebook's growth was about 400 million people. But Facebook today is a 2.1, 2.2 billion user platform. So it's a very large platform and the forecasts were wrong. Now, the forecast wasn't wrong, it just didn't intend to take into account everything great that the company was going to do. So if there's anything we can learn from this is that if you're intentional about growth and you're really trying to sort of break through these forecasts and these ceilings, you can grow really, really fast. So this applies to every company and I show this graph to everyone that joined Airbnb and be like, hey, Aaron, they join the growth team at Airbnb and try to get them to think in the same way. So natural adoption, which is sort of like that initial forecast of, of how fast your product is growing without any of that work is always going to eventually slow down. But if you do the things that you do as a growth team, you can't sort of like continue to push, push the growth of your company. Now, um, I mentioned this before, um, having a growth team before you find product market fit isn't really useful. So let's talk about product market fit. Well, it's, it's a sort of important term, but it's hard, hard to, hard to um, sort of exactly define what it is. So the w one way that I think about measuring product market fit is, is these two things. First, you find the metric, and you can do this for yourself after this talk. Find the metric that represents the value that your customers get from your product. And then you measure the repeat usage of that metric. It sounds pretty simple, and we'll see, see if it works. Um, you can make this kind of um, for, uh, table if you want, where you have the company, you have the metric that represents sort of the, the value you should get from your product, and then you have the ideal frequency. So let's take, let's take Airbnb. So you get value from Airbnb when you are booking and staying. So when, you, when you're actually traveling Airbnb, that's when you find that Airbnb is really val valuable. It's an amazing, amazing experience. Unfortunately, people don't do that more than annually. So if you want to figure out the product market fit of Airbnb, it, you can always ask people after the first day, but you wouldn't really know until they book again, when they come back and book again. So because the booking cycles for travel is so slow, annual would be a good metric here. Let's take Facebook. So Facebook, if you come back to Facebook, being in voluntarily come back to Facebook as an active user, you're doing that because you find value. There's something that makes you come back to Facebook or Instagram or anything like that. Um, and the question then is how often should I come back? Well, probably daily or hourly or something like that. They, start, they, they started looking um, uh, monthly and then they went down to daily. I think they might be even going more than that. 
Um, let's talk about Gusto. What's the product value as a customer of Gusto that you get out of using Gusto? Well, when you run your payroll, which is sort of what Gusto do um, for your employees, that's sort of the, one of the best ways to sort of measure um, the value you get out of Gusto. And how often do you do that? Well, you run payroll every other week or every month. I'm not gonna go into details of all of this, but for Lyft, it might be rides. For Checker, it might be background checks. For Stripe, it might be transactions. Now, for your company, you should figure out what is the one metric that I can measure easily every day or every time it happens, um, and what's the ideal frequency through which that should happen? Um, if you can answer those two questions, you can make a cohort analysis of your own company right now, and you can start trying to figure out if you have product market fit. So then you want to me measure these things. So you take a graph. On one axis, you have time, and the other one, you have, you have the metric that we just decided. Um, and from that, you can try to figure out if you have um, high product market fit. So this company um, is measuring this on a weekly basis. The ideal use case uh, of this company is using this product on a weekly basis. So every week here, there's a dot, which is the percent of people that use this product on, on week zero, the first time they used it, they used it again. So let's take um, Startup School as an example. So I joined Startup School, and in week one, only 60% um, would come back to Startup School. And then in week four, only 30% will come back. Well, that would suggest that Startup School wouldn't be a very good product. But that would be a good way to measure if Startup School is actually a good product, people come back to all the content that we're creating. Um, I'll take another product. This is a great product. This is a kind of like a normal product, uh, a normal product we look like, because almost always you have a little bit too many people in the beginning of the product, and then it will go down over time, but it will sort of flatten out, where you keep measuring these, these events of your metrics. This might sound technical, but it's actually just a representation of how many people, each dot is how many people that's using your product for that metric that you decided on that, on that time window. Um, most good products flatten out. Let's look at some examples here. So these are uh, examples that based on payment retention. So this is a company that you have all heard of that um, retains 10% after one month and then 12% after 12 months. It's sort of like unusual. Who can that be? <laughs> Stripe. This is too hard. This is Shopify. Um, so Shopify have this product where a lot of people sign up, not that many people continue in month two, but then they kind of stick on forever. So what do we know from, 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 from this? Well, if, if this curve would go down to zero, or sort of keep going down, then Shopify would be a bad product. It wouldn't be something that actually found product market fit and should have been working on growth. In this case, they have good, good product market fit and they should be working on growth. They should do all they, all they can to continue to work on growth. They should do something about sort of like the initial onboarding here, where they lose a lot of people in the beginning, but they should be working on growth. Here's another company, 50% retention after one month and then 10% after 24 months. Sort of similar to Stripe, but like, or similar to Shopify, but they continue to lose users all the way down to even 24 months. Maybe there's some flattening out at the very end here, but even 12 months after people start paying for this product, there's the, every month fewer and fewer people pay for the product. Is this product market fit? Hard to say, but, but it's not an obvious case that they have found product market fit. Uh, so this is Blue Apron. Um, here's one that's pretty good. So 70% retention after 12 months, and then 30% after seven years. This company definitely have product, product market fit. Any ideas of which company this might be? You're all using it. Amazon, I heard Amazon, but it wasn't the right one. Apple, no. This is Netflix. So 70% of people that start paying for Netflix pay for Netflix seven years down the line. That's definitely a company with product market fit that should spend every time, everything they can working on growth. So raise your hand if you're, if you're measuring your retention right now. Not that many people. Well, there are other ways to figure out retention. If you're really small, um, you should go out and talk to your users. You should, you should ask them questions such as, how would you feel if you can no longer use my product? And you should sort of like say as close as you can to your users. This is like measuring retention like this. It's, it's very hard when you have 10 users. When you have 1,000, it's easier. 
But when you have 10 users, is very, this is not the way to do it. You can actually go and just talk to all of them in person. So there are other ways to measure it, but you sort of have to know that you have um, a product that's retaining. Um, otherwise, you shouldn't be working on growth because you're going to be, end up burning a lot of cycles on things that doesn't matter. Okay, so a lot of people might be wondering, how does growth and marketing relate to each other? Isn't it, is it the same thing? Or how should I think about it? Historically, the way you had a company 20 years ago is you had a product team that made the product, and then you had a marketing team or a product marketing team that marketed the product. That's how things used to work. And a lot of the sort of like hierarchies and companies or, or sort of organizations are still based on this idea that you have a product team that's separate from the marketing team. And these are different teams and different skill sets and, and engineers work over in the product team and then the marketing people work over the marketing team. Actually, it's not how things work anymore. So um, the way you should think about this is that, I'm gonna come to this in a, in a second, um, is that there is three time, three different types of people that can, sort of like organizations that can drive growth. Um, there is what I call the product growth or growth engineering. This has different names. This is effectively product managers, engineers, data scientists, and sometimes marketers that work on growth, but they work on growth using technology. So they're actively changing the product to drive more growth. And much of this work here is about people that already arrived here product but haven't really found the value of your product yet, and they're changing the product to make it grow faster. Um, conversion optimizations fall into this, this group. Um, some of the growth channels actually fall into this group. Now there's this big other group here, performance marketing, which is effectively Google and Facebook marketing, which is also super technical and super data driven. Um, I would argue that these things are very, very, very similar. So, Five or 10 years ago, you would go to a company, you would see these being very different groups, maybe different, different floors in the office. Now, they, in my opinion, they should sit together. So engineers should sit together with performance marketers uh, and vice versa, because they actually uh, are doing very similar things. Now, there's this fifth bu button, fifth thing should be number, number four, uh, three here, which is brand marketing. Uh, brand marketing is sort of like um, the hardest to measure uh, the, the hardest to measure a type of marketing, where you're not really having a direct response, you're not having someone directly giving you feedback on how that marketing perceived. You can't, you can't even measure that very easily. So this is not something that startups should be doing in the early days. In my opinion, startups should not be doing brand marketing until way down the line when sort of like they hit the limits on these two things. So startups should be doing these two things, and there, there's some qualifications to which you can do this, but almost everyone can do this. If you're a startup, you have engineers, you can do, product growth or growth engineering or, or, or things like that. All right, let's talk about that first part, product growth. So um, your product is a funnel. What does that mean? Your product has many, many, many steps between the first user and the person sort of like completing what they're trying to do on your product. Let's say I'm on an e-commerce store and I'm trying to buy something. There are many, many steps in that funnel and what the product growth team is working on is funnel optimization or conversion rate optimization. So if you look at what we did at Airbnb on the growth team, many of those growth teams were, were conversion rate, rate optimization uh, teams that work in a specific part of the funnel. So the funnel could start with uh, SEO, it could start with performance marketing, it could start with uh, referrals of virality, um, but it would jump through a number of different steps. Say sign up would be a very, very common step. Or if you're an e-commerce site, uh, payment conversion or, 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 or buying conversion. All of these steps are things that, as a conversion rate optimizing part of the growth team, should be working on. And these are the, some of the easiest things to get working on. And I'm gonna be a little bit high level here because to go into depth about every single area here is gonna be, uh, we're gonna go on for hours. So some of the um, sort of like good ideas of areas to start working on for conversion rate optimizations one of them is translation. So if you have an international product that's not translated, you should be thinking about that. That uh, immediately drives, um, up, um, drives more people to start using your product. The second thing is authentication. So most of your products probably have some idea of user accounts. You can sign up to your product um, and you can uh, come back and log into your product. 
you'd be surprised how much, how hard this is. And from Airbnb, I know we spent many years working on just authentication, signing up and logging in. It sounds so simple, but it turns out that's a very fragile moment of users sort of like flowing through your product that you can always continue to make optimizations. If you go to Airbnb and you go to Pinterest today, um, assume that whatever is there in terms of uh, authentication is the most op optimized version. Th these companies spend an enormous amount of time optimizing um, sign-up conversion. Another big area for conversion optimization is onboarding. So when I, I, I come to your product, um, what's the first thing I experience? And sort of like, how do I, what, what can the product do to bring me towards um, the value of the product as quickly as possible? Those are things that you work on when you work on convert, uh, onboarding. And then another big area here is purchase conversion. So sort of like when I'm about to buy something, a product, and actually kind of take the final decision uh, around what you do, there's so many things you can do here. Um, all right, so then there is something called growth channels. So what is a growth channels? Growth channels is sort of how people discover your product. Now there is, when you're a small company, and I don't know how, how big you guys are, but let's say you have less than 50 users, you shouldn't really be thinking about growth channels. Even if you're less than 500 users, you probably shouldn't be thinking about this because it's too early. But the things that you do when you're small that don't scale, have the word don't scale in it for a reason. They don't actually scale. And there are very few companies who kind of grow big without growing on one of these scalable growth channels. There are not that many platforms, and channel slash platform can be used in the same way. There are not that many things that are really, really big in the world on which you can build um, uh, a large company. So let's talk about what those, those channels are. So the first thing here is basically, uh, you think through the behavior of, of, of your product, and let's talk about the first one here, which is, if um, the way I discover your product is a rare behavior where people use Google to find a solution. And this is actually how very, a lot of products in the world are being discovered. If you have something through which to answer the question around what you do, once a year you go to Google, probably if you're building a company trying to answer that question, you should be on, you should be on Google. So a good example here might be buying a house. You aren't buying a house more than once or twice in your entire life which means when you go and buy a house, you're probably going to go to Google, which is not surprisingly that something like Zillow or Redfin or all of those different sites that allow you to buy homes online are entirely optimized for SEO and, and sometimes uh, paid search. Um, if you are using something every day, you're not gonna go back to Google every day, you're gonna go straight to that product. You're gonna open the app on your phone, you're gonna go to the, straight to the website, whatever it might be. You're not gonna go to Google anymore to just kind of figure out which of the different things I'm going to use. And now there, Google is not the only search engine, there are other search engines sort of like, um, that you can optimize for as well, but Google, Google is the one that still matters. Next behavior, um, do people of, of, of my product already share the product using word of mouth? So if that's the case, then there are lots of things you can do around virality and referrals. So you can grow your product by kind of accelerating that behavior from your existing users um, and you can either incentivize them with referrals where you're getting paid, or you can do it for free and with, with, with using virality te techniques. Um, thus, having more users on my product actually improve my experience. So what I mean by that, well, if I am building the next LinkedIn, it makes sense, the product is not as valuable when it's just all of us on LinkedIn, but when it's a bunch of more people and companies on LinkedIn, it makes sense that the value kind of increases. Well, in that sense, you should absolutely continue to do virality because every single new user is sort of an opportunity to bring in more users. So th here's another way to think about virality. And then this is the common question I ask companies in sort of the early days of YC. Can you make a list, literally a spreadsheet, of all the people in the world that would use my product? Let's say I sell to um, buyers who decides to um, um, doctor's offices, they sell to doctor's offices. Well, I can probably make a list of all the doctor's offices in, in, the, in the United States or in California. It wouldn't be that hard. It's totally possible. So I would find a way to make that list and then we'd go out and do sales. And this is surprisingly something, often something that you should start with. If you can make that list, if you know who those people are, you should go out and do sales. 
And the last one here is, does my users have high LTV? Does my user ha does, does it, does, do I charge enough for my product for it to be valuable? Well, then I should definitely go and do paid acquisition, uh, for example, Google and Facebook. I shouldn't do acquisitions or paid ads unless I actually um, am charging for my product. All right, I'm gonna go through each one of these. Sort of like, it's not gonna be possible to go into super deep detail for all of them, but I'm gonna go into a little bit deeper into some of them and, and not the others. All right, let's talk about referrals. So I, I, I worked on a referral program at Airbnb for a very long time. Um, the way to think about referrals is sort of a engineered word of mouth. Um, so if, if people are already talking about your product, uh, referrals is, is a way through which you can engineer more people talking about your product. One way could be just making it easier. Another way could be by using um, financial incentives. So in the Airbnb referral program, we had a financial incentive where um, as a referrer, I would make $20 for every user that would sign up in travel credit. And as a referee, I would, I would um, get $40 um, as a new user of Airbnb in travel credit. And we would, we would kind of like start with that principle and then try to get as many people what we call through our referrals funnels as possible. So you, met, you notice I'm, I used the word funnel here again. So every product is a funnel. And even the referral product, which is a sort of a product of itself inside Airbnb, had its own funnel. So uh, I'm not gonna go through all of the de de these details, but the way you think about something that's kind of engineering and product-led is that you break it down into, into different steps and then you measure every single one of these steps um, and then you kind of measure the conversion rate to the very end. So the first step here, here is weekly active users that saw the referral program. So how many users saw the referral program? If I wasn't measuring this step, I wouldn't know how many people did that. When we started measuring this step, and I've seen this with many other companies when who have a referral program, is that a small percentage of your active users see the referral program. Well, how could you be expected to use it if you can't see it? So we started measuring this in the early days of Airbnb. Um, turns out that there's a lot of opportunity of just telling people about you ha having a referral program, but then there's all these opportunities to, to optimize th uh, through that funnel. So there's um, sort of people sending invites, how many they sent to, the conversion rate to new users and to new guests, and finally to them booking their first time nights. Here's another display. And th this slide is gonna be available online afterwards so you don't have to uh, take notes of photos. Um, we kind of separate the, the, the funnel into even more detail, and we would continue to optimize this for years. Like, this all matters um, a lot, and we would continue to optimize for years. Um, I'm gonna go through one, one example of sort of like one of those conversion rate optimizations we did for the referral program. So here's the referral invite email. So if, if someone else, if I invited someone, one of you guys, you get one of these emails. Um, and the email would say, Gustav Alstrom invited you to Airbnb. Gustav sent you $40 on your first trip. Uh, on Airbnb, you can book rooms, blah, blah. Just sign up on 25th of May, 2018. And then there's a button to call accept the invitation. And then there's a photo of me and my name. Looks pretty good. Um, now, this email is the result of dozens of experiments. Nothing here is random. Everything here is for a reason. Let's talk about that. The first one is the Subic line. The subic line has my name. If it's sent to any of my friends, that makes them more likely to open it. The sort of like headline of the email have a clear value. It's very, very clear what this email is about. You'd be surprised how many emails that don't have a clear headline and a clear value of sort of what the email is about. This email is about that I sent you $40 on your first trip on this website called Airbnb. This which is uh, sign up by May 25th, 2018, is urgency. You should sign up by, by May 25th, 2018. That's the urgency that makes you actually go, that increases the chance of people to receive this email actually go and do it. The name here, accept invitation, it's a sense of exclusivity. It's not, it doesn't say sign up for a reason, because sign up, anyone can sign up. But accepting an invitation sends an idea of exclusivity. And finally, it has my name, where I live and how long I've been a user of Airbnb with my photo. That's really strong social proof that I endorse this website. I endorse this product. So the way you think about this is sort of how you think about all the conversion rate optimization. It's a set of optimizations. 
pay growth. This is one of the areas I'm not going to go too deep, too deep into the, the options here. The things that matter for pay growth is that you shouldn't do it unless you have revenue. Too many companies are buying ads when they don't have any revenue or know how they're going to make any revenue. That's a big mistake. You shouldn't be doing that. If you have revenue, there's a couple of concepts that really matter. The first one, how much money am I paying for each new users that I'm acquiring? It's called custom acquisition cost or CAC. What's the lifetime value or payback time of the users um, that I've acquired through pay growth? So what that means is what's the longest that I can, with some level of accuracy, forecast how much these users will be worth? If a user is paying $10 uh, per month, and then we can sort of have this cohort analysis that we had in the beginning with the retention, we can figure out exactly how much our user is going to be worth. And if my customer acquisition cost is lower than my lifetime value, then that's good. That means you have a, a great payback time. If, if you only pay $20 for a user, um, that means if you make $10 per month, you have probably around $20, uh, two months payback time. That's more complicated than that, but it's sort of like a s simplified version. These are the most important concepts to keep in mind for, for pay growth. Um, attribution. So this matters if things get complicated. If you're using both Google and Facebook, if you're getting to some, some level of scale, you need to understand what it means to attribute a new paid user to a, a dollar that you spent. Um, I'm not going to go too much into detail what this means, but, but this is something that you should learn if you're spending time on paid growth. And finally, in my opinion, there are only four channels that sort of matters at scale. Facebook, Instagram, Google, and YouTube. These are the very, very large uh, paid growth channels through which many companies are actually built on these days. Um, sort of like one of the um, sort of unspoken truth, in my opinion, is that a lot of the free channels of growth is going down and the, pay, and the paid channels are going up. A uh, good example of that is that it's hard to grow on the Facebook newsfeed unless you're paying Facebook money. Same is true for Instagram. It's sort of changing always. When there's a new platform, um, they often kind of promote free usage in the beginning, and then they start to monetize that. And that's sort of what's happening for both Facebook, uh, Google, and Instagram today. All right, search engine optimization. So search engine optimization or SEO, uh, some people might say, well, this is something of the past. In my experience, it is not. Um, it still matters because as long as we go back to Google, to make our decisions about what we want to do in the future, uh, this matters. Um, Google is uh, probably one of the largest websites in the world. Um, this is a big deal. The one thing you should know about SEO is that there's a difference between what you see on a website and what Google see. So Google can't view images. Google can't view JavaScript very easily. So if you go to Airbnb and you see all of this, just remember that Google can't see this. So if you're trying to communicate to someone who's searching for Stockholm on, a, on, on Google or apartments in Stockholm, this is not what's going to be delivered back to Google. Google is going to see a bunch of lines of text through which you have marked up in your code and that Google have hopefully indexed if you've done the right thing. Um, and if you haven't, then it's kind of like, your fault. So there are a bunch of basics through, that you can do with SEO. You just have to get right. The easiest thing you can do is to run your website through an SEO browser and try to figure out if you only saw this, would you understand what your product is about? So using clear language, um, not in JavaScript, um, to describe what your product does is the most basic things you can do for, for SEO. There's two different areas of optimization for SEO. Um, and, and, and this is as high level as it gets. So at Airbnb, there's a team of 20 people working on this, of which 12 or 13 are engineers. This is a really, really big deal, but, but, but this is sort of the high level. There's two types of optimizations for SEO. There are things that you can change on your website, and there are other people in the world are linking to your websites. So this is the two main levers that you have in SEO. For the on-page optimization, the right way to start is not to start with like, oh, let's make some changes. The right way is to start with the strategy. What am I trying to rank for? What keywords exist on Google today that I might want to be the number one result for? 
Now, to do that, you have to do what's called a keyword analysis or keyword research. You have to try to figure out what are all the things that people are searching for that might relate to my product. And then hopefully they have some amount of large volume that they're searching for. And then I can try to say, well, these keywords that have sort of a medium to high volume and they're not that much competition around these keywords, those are the ones I want to rank for. When you decide that that, the other areas of on-page optimization is now are easier because now you know what you're trying to, to rank for. At scale, but I've seen this at small scale too, um, SEO at this point is about SEO experimentation, which means you can do the set of, of, um, of, uh, of best practices in SEO. It might take you to be a decent sized company, but if you want to become a massive company, a really, really large company that's growing through SEO, you have to use experimentation to make those decisions. The other thing that matters here is off-page optimization. Who's linking to you? So there are lots of tools you can use to figure out who are all the websites online that links to you. What's their sort of domain authority? Are they actually authoritative on the web to have something? That's, there's a huge difference if, if I will link to your website or if New York Times link to your website. It matters a lot in sort of how um, in um, Google's perception of your, of, your, of your site. So one surprising way at Airbnb is that we had a lot of press, a lot of people in the world from media would come and, and, and write about Airbnb, and that was surprisingly important for our, our off-page optimizations. If you have people writing about you, either in press or in other areas, that's actually a great thing. If you don't have anyone writing about you, well, you're not gonna have that many links because the web has changed. There aren't that many links anymore. Kind of, It's not like everyone have a, a, a website these days. They're linking to each other. So these have, things have changed. You have to be strategic about who are you getting links from. The easiest way you can do is whenever you get written out, up by anyone, press or, or whatever, just ask them to link to you. It matters to you. Um, last thing I wanna talk about here is on, on growth teams. Um, so a growth team today, um, is typically engineers, data scientists, um, designers, product managers, and user researchers. Um, these are not the, all the people you might have in your company today, but these are the company, companies that you will have when you start making decisions around growth. The way you organize the growth team is there's sort of two options. You either have the growth team as its own team, and the rest of the product is, is the product team, um, and that's actually sort of my, the, the challenge here is that when, you, when you're a small company and, and you're not kind of like somewhat ignorant about growth, what you e often say is like, I've hired a growth engineer, I hired a growth product manager, that person is going to be doing all the growth in the company. That's sort of not really a recipe for success. Um, so there's it's kind of a fine balance here where, between saying um, everyone is responsible for growth, which doesn't work, and having a small team that is responsible for all the growth. You kind of have to ba find a balance here, and the right way to find that balance is to set very clear goals and, goals and very clear dividing lines in your product. So a good example here might be everyone that works on the core product, which is sort of the, the value of your product. Let's say I am Gusto. Uh, the the, the, the uh, uh, um, running payroll for employees is the core product. Now, everyone trying to get to that experience, that's sort of like the growth area of Gusto. So that'd be one easy way to kind of make distinction between growth and product. So how do you decide what to work on? Um, you make a simple calculation of what's the effort, what's the minimal viable thing I wanna try, try here, um, and sort of how big of an outcome can that be? So I always try to forecast out the outcomes before you actually start doing the work. Because if you're forecasting something and a best case scenario, it's small, you shouldn't be doing it even though it's a low effort. All right, I have two small short sections left of this talk. Um, the first one is called making decisions. Um, if you ask any product manager at Airbnb today, um, what is the most important tool or learning that you learned at Airbnb that you'll apply to your next thing? they would say uh, experiment or experiment framework or some way of making A-B tests inside the company. Um, and I'm, I'm so happy that Suhail is talking later because I stole a, um, a quote from his investor deck that I found online. Uh, this is the quote. Most of the world will make decisions by either guessing or using the gut. They will either be lucky or wrong. If you keep making decisions without using data and experimentation, you will be lucky or wrong. 
And this is a huge problem. So if you, if you kind of get to a scale of Airbnb or something even smaller than that, then every decision you're gonna make that you don't use A-B testing for, you won't actually know what the full true outcome of that decision might be. So at Airbnb, we use experimentation and A-B testing for every single major decision in the, enti in the entire company. So this is how that tool works at Airbnb, but I'm gonna talk sort of, sort of like more about how that looked like. Let's say in your company, you decide to ship a feature. Um, and this is how many kind of measurements of ma that metric per day, and, and the Wednesday here is when I ship that new feature. And then I look at it two weeks later, and it looks like that the metric of that feature went up. So that was a good thing, right? Well, it's not that easy, because there's so many more different factors. Who knows what happened between here? If you're a soccer app and the World Cup just started, well, that, and you wouldn't know if the features have made any difference. If um, this was just peak season of whatever you're doing, this is a school app, education app, and this is September, then you wouldn't know either. So the only way you would know is what ha what's called a counterfactual, basically an A-B test. By running two different versions of the same feature, of the same site, at the same time, you would be able to know um, what the true difference between making these decisions and not making it was. This might sound a little bit technical, but it's very, very important to internalize. Because you will get to a point where you were successful up until that point, and you think that you're so good at making these decisions, and then they get harder to make. And you have to have a framework to make these decisions. So, what we, and because this was so important at Airbnb, we, we built something we call experiment, experiment review. Experiment review is when the whole growth team would meet in a room like this, would go through all the features that we had recently built, and before we told you which, which of the different features in the experiment they actually won, we would ask the audience. So I'm gonna do that with you guys here. So here's a photo of our experiment review. We would do this every two or three weeks. It's really fun, but it drove home this one thing, which is that making practice decisions are really hard. All right, let's get started. So the goal of this project was to increase the number of shares from the Airbnb mobile app, specifically the number of shares of listings. And back at, at that time, we had two options. We had the native share sheet that you all know about, and then we have this experiment share sheet which takes up the entire screen and has more colors. Same type of buttons, sort of. You can see the difference here. Now, before I show the answer, how many here think that the native share sheet led to more shares? Raise your hand. It's about half the room. How many here thought that the new share sheet that one of our engineers built drew more shares? Raise your hand. So most, many hands did not raise. I'm assuming you guys think there was no difference. Because this is so hard, you have to make a decision. You have to make a decision. You have to have an opinion. If you don't have an opinion here, you're basically saying, uh, I can't decide. So this share sheet led to 40% more shares. So very important in this case that we'd use experimentation because if we'd just gone by a gut, we would have been wrong. Half of the room, more than half of the room would have been wrong. Let's do one more. So we sent out this email to existing users of Airbnb uh, uh, to, to sort of, um, when I would book, make a booking at Airbnb, we sent out this email to the people that I listed as my co-travelers. And the email uh, will look in the control like this, where it would have the itinerary, the address to that listing, and the button on that email would say, join Gustav's trip. Um, now we tried a new version, where the email looked a little bit different, a less content, and then we have a different button here called accept Gustav's trip invitation. How many here, the goal here was to get sign up, so people have to click on this button and then sign up. How many here think that uh, John Gustav's trip in the control led to more sign ups? Raise your hand. Some people. How many here think that accept Gustav's trip invitation? Raise your hand. That's good. How many here think that there was no difference? So this is a 14% increase uh, of, of just changing the basically the name of the button. Let's try one more for simplicity. Um, so in this case, another sharing experiment. Uh, I'm kind of giving you the very easy to understand ones. Um, so the control here was sort of like a bunch of sharing options on the Airbnb listing. We had some Twitter icons, and Facebook icons, and email icons. 
We had another version of that, which the icons were round. And then we have one that was called sort of square buttons, and it was just displaying email and Facebook. And then you can click on more. How many here thought if the goal was sharing that the control with the icons won? Raise your hand. Some people. How many here thought that the round buttons were better? Raise your hand. Some people. How many of you ever thought the square buttons? Wow, you guys are really good. How many thought there was no difference? Well, both of these were winners. Uh, this was by far the biggest winner. Um, and these are the kind of things that we debated. And because we run experiments, you don't have to debate anymore. So proc decisions are really hard. At scale, you want to use experimentation and A-B testing to make these, these decisions. Because otherwise, it will be the loudest room a lot of voice in the room, they'll make decisions, and you don't want that. To summary, sort of my talk, um, if you're running a startup, you should be thinking about growth. Um, before you start working on growth tactics, you should be measuring your attention and knowing if people are using, repeatedly using your product. Um, you should pick a metric and then pick a goal for that metric and drive that metric towards that goal. Very simple. And then eventually, but not right away, you should start running A-B tests for the decisions that are hard to make. In the early days, decisions are not that hard to make because they might be obvious. But the moment they're not easy anymore, you should be building, doing this with experimentation. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Yes? You said that experimentation is important for SEO. Do you have any frameworks or ways you would think about you know, trying experiments beyond just picking something randomly and then testing it with A-B testing? So the question was around experimentation in SEO. Um, how do you go about doing that? So um, what you're trying to test when you run an, an, an on-page experiment, what you're trying to test is sort of the amount of organic traffic you get from Google and the sort of how your ranking shifts. So Google actually are changing the rankings all the time. So if you make a big change on your website on, say, say half, let's, let's say, let's call you have, um, for Airbnb's case, uh, listing pages. Sorry, uh, search, search results pages. So Stockholm, London, San Francisco, we buy one group, and then you have New York, Paris, and Barcelona, we another group. You would change the content on the first group of pages, but not the others. Within not too long of a time, you would see more or less traffic going to either of these groups from Google. Sometimes there's no difference. But there, if there is a difference, you'll see more traffic. Um, I'll give you an idea of a very small change you can make. Let's, let's, let's for example, change the uh, title tag from Airbnb listings to the 20 top best listings in Barcelona. One of them is going to rank better because it's going to be more inviting to click on. Um, and then you run that experiment towards the search engine, and then the search engine will, will kind of tell you which one is better based on the amount of traffic and the search ranking that you get. Yes. Let's say that we're totally bought in on the river of maybe testing, but we're very early stage start. I feel like we don't have enough traffic. And so something that our team debates is we want to A-B test, but it feels like it's not worth the effort because the results will not be reliable. How do you, what guidance do you have for uh, sort of navigating that transition? So the, question was, the question was around A-B testing. Um, how do I determine if it's right for me when I'm really early? Um, so A-B testing is a function of change. So you can have a medium to small size audience if the change is large enough, it actually can be significant. Like the numbers can be uh, significant. Now, what you can do is you go do, um, you can go to Google and type in A-B testing calculator and there's a kind of a form will pop up and you can type in sort of the, the, the metric that you have and then the change. And you can see how big the change have to be for you to be able to see a difference. Now, if you're really, really small, you probably shouldn't, shouldn't be doing A-B testing at all. So I would do A-B testing when you have lar like enough traffic that you can see a medium to small size change within, say, two or three weeks. So let's say a small change would be a couple of percent. Um, if you can see that in a couple of, couple of weeks, um, kind of like that's sort of the level you, you could be at. Um, that's probably sort of my, my general recommendation. Um, I've certainly seen a lot of companies um, that are early embracing A-B testing relatively early and then have that guide sort of their, their decision making. 
And I don't think that's a bad idea because I think that's much, it's better to start a little bit too early than to start way too late. Um, if, if those are the only two options. Of course you start at the right time. Yeah. How do, you, how do you apply growth to high barrier entry market like, like health insurance? So um, I think you should separate sort of the acceleration of your growth in that market and the market itself. So if it's hard to reach people, um, that means you have to probably um, try to reach to a, reach a lot more people before you actually get sort of a, um, if, 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 if a high, tell me what you mean by, by sort of like a high barrier. Well, for example, it's a bit of, with insurance, you have to do risk sharing, right? And you have to have a lot of people immediately in order for one person to want to buy your product. And so it's kind of this, the classic chicken and egg problem, but there's also a pile of regulation and social risk on top of it. Yes. Yeah, so if you have a risk and regulation involved, um, I don't think that the principle of growth changes, but if you're purely growing through sales, um, for example, you can apply a lot of automation and technology to how, how to do sales. So if I'm a company and I'm selling to um, insurance buyers at startups, um, I might be starting by emailing 10 people. And in fact, I can email 100 people or 1,000 people with the same type of level of... Um, um, the email itself is kind of a field as, as personal and as direct to that, to that receiver um, as if I send one email that I just wrote myself. So there's certainly kind of things that you can apply to your uh, growth that allows you to reach a lot more people. Now, growth doesn't solve any of the risk challenges at all. It doesn't ch solve any kind of major market issues. And Airbnb certainly had a lot of issues with, with legal, like, um, legal challenges in different markets. And sort of growth was dis disconnected from that. That wasn't sort of our, our, our goal. If you're a startup that have those, those problems, I don't think you should solve them. Solving them and solving growth are two different things. And they're very separate from each other. And, and growth is a way to accelerate you getting to more health insurance buyers. Um, it doesn't actually say anything whether that's, that's uh, a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, do, I uh, do I have any vis wisdom of, of using non-sustainable tactics in a new, new market like Uber? So um, if you're doing things that don't scale, um, you sort of have two options. One is they don't scale, so you should stop doing them eventually. Or you build sort of a, a playbook where you take those skills and you kind of try them in a different city. Now, they might not eventually scale. So let's say I am out manually to recruit Uber drivers. Now that might be an unsustainable uh, growth tactic. It might be working for the first 20 drivers, but eventually is not gonna have high ROI in comparison to say, running ads on Facebook to recruit drivers. So um, I think you kind of have to determine this manual thing that I'm doing in the very beginning, which is doing things that don't scale, which is sort of recruiting every single user to become a user of your product, uh, eventually it won't work anymore and you kind of have to find another channel uh, or it won't w be high ROI in comparison to the other channels. And you'll, most companies will go through this transition period where you go from, say, writing content manually to um, through engineering, changing your website so that you get more search traffic, for example. What about doing subsidies or incentives for rides? Well, I, don't, I actually think the incentives are super scalable. Like at Airbnb, we still have the referral program. They're signing up, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of users uh, every day almost, which, and a large portion of them are signing up through, through referrals. So that is an example where subsidies are actually scalable. Now, um, me handing you a coupon in your hand is not scalable, but doing that through an email system or through WhatsApp or through Messenger or some other channel is actually scalable as long as you're not losing, uh, losing the money. So you have to have a very good ROI calculation on the money that you're handing out. And knowing that that's incremental money, that if you didn't get give that money out, those users wouldn't actually start using your product. Um, so as long as you have a good handle on that, that is totally fine. Yes.
three percent of our users are paying for premium features, but the other ninety-seven percent are using the free features. But thirty percent of those guys are using it more than two hours a day, so they really like those free features, but aren't willing to pay for the premium features. So how much of like before we invest in that growth? Um, I guess how do we kind of find what those three, uh, what the limits of those three features would be to still achieve? Um, um, so the question was around, you have two groups of users, so the free users and then the paying users, and some of them are very active and some of them are not, not as active, but at least they don't want to pay. How would you use growth there? So one of the things that we're trying to figure out is what is the retention rate of those paying users? Are they actually sticking around and using the product that they're paying for? And what's the retention rate for the free users? Do that change once it starts paying? Um, and then I will look at the conversions or like how, what percent of the free users am I converting to paid? And there's many different ways to do that. There's one which is having the freemium concept. You can also have a free trial, which means you actually don't have freemium. You can just have a, a very limited set of, of, of free users and then they kind of have to go to paid. But ultimately, to the extent that you should be growing all of this comes down to how much usage you have from these, the, the, one you, the, one, the users that you value. So if the paid users are the one you value the most, if, if they stop using a product after three months, then you have a more fundamental problem than the conversion between these two groups. So I would still go back to retention and look at usage for those people and see, are they actually sticking around and using the product? Last question from over here. Yes, in the back. I have a question. I have a friend who is the head of product uh, growth at a large company. Um, and she was telling me that they're actually growing their product market share by um, so the question is, uh, sometimes experimentation can be really hard uh, to execute. Is there an ideal sort of frequency or, or which, which experiment should I be actually be running? Um, for something like uh, a marketplace, experimentation is really hard. Um, that is correct. Um, so um, in that case, it's easier, it's harder than just setting up a, a simple tool online or using Mixpanel to set up your simple A-B test. It's more difficult than that. If you are kind of having a simple product funnel, it's generally not that hard to set up experimentation. If you have an engineer and if you have a um, um, decent amount of traffic, it's not that hard to set it up. Now, there's different kind of products that make experimentation harder. Um, I think that if you're at the at, at this stage where you have a lot of traffic, you sh in my opinion, you don't have really an option. You sort of have to invest in some level of infrastructure to use data to make decisions. If you don't do that, the alternative cost is you end up making a lot of bad decision where they are either long or they're lucky. You're lucky because they're right or you're wrong. So you don't really have an option but to run experiments. And it is true that there are some type of products through which the experimentation is easy. If you're running a mobile app, experimentation is not that difficult. There are lots of tools you can use to run experimentations. If you're running out of ideas for experiments, well, then you should go back to user research and you should look at other products that are, are sort of, um, look at something like Pinterest or Airbnb or Facebook, they're probably highly optimized. So a lot of the things in their funnels is there for very specific reasons uh, because of A-B testing. Um, so I don't, I don't have any better answer than if you don't do it, you'll have a lot of other problems. Uh, and in terms of the frequency, um, there is a cost to setting up an experiment, and that cost should be minimized as much as possible. Um, but it's sort of like you should just try to get better at it and, and pick the easiest, smallest thing that you can test and just test that. If you have a big new feature you want to test, well, just test the first part of that feature. Don't test all of it and see how people react to the, kind of the first part of the feature. I can talk for hours about this, but thank you very much.